got somebody who thinks he's tough as a nickel steak. But they all come to speed for the do re me. Now get this. We ain't partners. We ain't brothers and we ain't friends. My little brother was 15 years old. Think about that. You're waiting for How about cutting heat? Oh, I get it. You want some kind of contest, huh? You're real smart boy, ain't you? I guess maybe you'll have to kill me. Little hurt if I do. Well, it looks like I finally ran into someone that likes to play as rough as I do. Yeah, this must be a lucky night. And my body, they're not nice like me. Are we supposed to say thanks? You're not supposed to say nothing. Told ya. Money. Everyone wants it. Until now, Monty Booster didn't have it. They tell me you're my only living relative. But he just made money the old-fashioned way. You have 30 days in which to spend 30 million bucks. He inherited it. If you can do it, you get 300 million. But if you fail, you don't get diddly. Why can't I tell my friends? Because I don't want anybody to help me out. Ah! What's wrong? Mike, what's wrong? 30 million dollars. The man just got 30 million dollars. This is a good day, you know. He can't keep it unless he can spend it and have nothing left but the shirt on his back. Oh, we're going to have a, a lot of fun with this kind of money. <laughs> Jay, I'd like to hire you as my official photographer. Salary, $10,000 a week. How would you like to be my personal driver for the next 30 days at $5,000 a week? What a country. America, I love it. Hey, everybody, anybody want to go to lunch? Everyone thinks he's crazy. I want to bet $50,000. It went up. I think we should consider the possibility of psychiatric help. At the rate you're going, you'll have spent your entire inheritance in less than a month, and you'll have nothing to show for it. But $300 million says he's right on the money. Richard Pryor and John Candy. It's like that old saying, you know, if for money I'd be a millionaire, I'm a millionaire. Brewster's Millions, coming soon from Universal Pictures. Hello, folks, this is Last Call of Torchies. I am one of your hosts, Gary Hill. With me on this lovely last sunny day for a while afternoon in Indiana is um, <laughs> one Lee Russell. How you doing, sir? Uh, nursing a hangover. Uh, I'm starting to feel my age a little bit, but uh, other than that, not bad. That uh, that still looked look like, look like liquid tar last night I saw you drinking, so I imagine if you had a couple mm-hmm. too many, yep. you'd be uh, feeling it. <laughs> <laughs> I bet it was fucking tasty, though. It was. It was. Oh, my gosh. Although it's with me tonight, uh, t- today, I keep thinking tonight, it's today. It's, it's, it's the afternoon here. Uh, it's, uh, Mr. Cameron Scott, how you doing, sir? I'm pretty good, pretty good. I'm working on my first drink of the day, starting to day drink, you know, like us adults do. Yeah. Uh, because, it, it, you know, because we can. Mm-hmm. <laughs> It is, it is, it is Sunday, and I don't judge anyway, so whatever, <laughs> do, do what you like. Um, Having a little peach bellini, you know, nice. <laughs> feeling slightly sophisticated, and then we'll work up the hard liquor later on. There you go. <laughs> Fancy. Oh, boy. We're uh, traveling the year 1985, and back back to New York City again, and, and Hackensack, New Jersey, respectively. Um Discovered Bruce's Millions from 1985. This, of course, starring um, the great Richard Pryor and the great John Candy. Uh, just to name some other folks off that are on this list. Uh, Lynette McKee as Angela Drake. Stephen Collins as uh, Warren Cox. Um, Jerry Orbach as Charlie Pegler, his, his, his coach for the Hackensack Bulls. Uh, Pat Hingle as uh, Edward Roundfield, um, the guy who's doing what he does with uh, the estate there. Um, yeah. You, you didn't know your great-great-grandfather was a honky? Uh, Hume Crone <laughs> <laughs> shows up as uh, Uncle Rupert Horn. Um, yeah, the guy started all that shit. Uh, coming back again, uh, Jason, uh, Jason Peter Jason as Chuck Fleming, our, our action news reporter. <laughs> Uh, Dave, this is cool. David Wall, who you may know as the Dean from Revenge of the Nerd, shows up as uh, Eugene Provost, who's like his accountant type person. Um, yeah. 
it's it's it's, it's got a fun cast to it. Um, your basic plot synopsis: This is a a remake of a novel and another film of, of the same t- title, uh, in a way. Um, a minor league baseball player has to spend thirty million in thirty days in order to inherit three hundred million. However, he's, he's not allowed to own any assets, destroy the money, gift it, give the charity, or tell anyone about the deal. Um, yes, yeah, this is this is uh, better better than I remember being. So I I, I kind of this felt feel like this film got a, lot, got a lot of meat to it as far as like this kind of movie goes. So I'm gonna start with Cameron first and say, uh, what do you think, sir? You know, this movie has aged like uh, somewhat like a fine wine to me because I remember not liking it as a child. Like when I saw it and I wasn't like nine, ten years old, I remember not being into it, just like going, I don't get it. You know, people spending money to make I just I just didn't get it. Uh, But as an adult, you know, I probably haven't seen this in 10, 12 years and I like it a lot more. I feel like it's say in saying that, I got to say, though. It's a bit of a misfire because I feel like they misuse John Candy almost on an extreme level. He's not allowed to shine. That's just my opinion. But I love all the characters in it. I love seeing Torchies pop up because mm-hmm. because I watched it with my wife and she was like, "Isn't that the Miss Torchies?" I'm like, "Yes, it is." Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, seeing Rick Moranis pop up for a hot minute in it. Yakov Smirnoff popping up for a hot mm-hmm. minute too. You know, at this uh, what the country. It's. It's it's great, and I love Hume Cronin in it. He's just a cantankerous old fart. It's just a shame that he's not in it more. It's just everybody in this is somebody that you recognize from something. Uh, like I, I said, I, I feel like it's a little bit dry, but it has aged much better than I thought it would. I was just like, mm, what am I going to think of this? I, I think it's great, and I'm a sucker for anything with Richard Pryor. And he he is gold in everything he does, but yeah, it's it's aged very well for me. Cool, Lee. Um, this was pretty enjoyable. Uh, usually you get into these sort of movies in the 1980s, and they tend to not age well. But like Cameron's saying, this this one does kind of age pretty well. I think. Um, I think mostly because the performances are really good and. It has this sort of almost fun fantasy edge to the concept in, in a way where you can't really take anything going on in it too serious. And, you know, there's also like no o- overt racism or, hey, white rich people are OK. <laughs> Look into the next movie when we talk about that. Um, <laughs> here, you know, Pryor gets to do a thing a little bit more. Um, I think this is one of his better movie performances. I don't. I don't think him in on the on the uh, sort of stand up stage ever really made the transition to movies perfectly, but I think he's pretty effective here. Um, I liked John Candy in this, maybe a little bit more in Cameron, but I do agree. I feel like maybe he's held back a little too much. Like there, I think there was more potential as like a comedy duo here that they didn't really tap into. Like there was no, I'd, I'd say there's no like big super laugh out loud jokes for me in this movie. It, it's it's kind of a movie of like little moments that make you chuckle and keep you moving along and watching it. Um, and I definitely enjoyed that. I enjoyed that there's kind of a sly anti-political message or at least political apathy to some degree kind of shoehorned into this. Kind of like, you know what, politics are kind of bullshit. Maybe you shouldn't vote for anybody kind of thing. I, I kind of like that message sometimes, <laughs> um, especially in the 1980s, which just feels kind of crazy now, seeing that in, like, Reagan's fucking America. Um, I I kind of like that Rick Moranis only pops up for a second and does that character and then never shows up again, basically. because <laughs> That's of, great. <laughs> I, I, I kind of figure if he'd like showed up throughout the entire film and might get a little grating because all he does is mimic people. <laughs> uh, so that, that might have been a little much. Um, and I mean, any movie that starts out with like the promise of a four-way nude massage that turns into a bar fight right afterwards... Uh, <laughs> You're kind of you're kind of winning me right out of the gates a little bit. Um, yeah, I enjoyed this. 
I thought it was pretty good. You see, the Chinese have a right with the massage. You know, it's the fabric that gets in the way of the massage. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like you're wasting time. That, uh... <laughs> yeah, John Candy almost talked himself into some uh, skinny blonde, uh, 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 little bit of skirt there. Uh, I, I was kind of like, man, are they going to bring her back like later as the love interest for John Candy or something? Like, no, nah, John Candy doesn't get a love interest. Who are we kidding? No, there's not enough room for a love interest in this movie. Mm-hmm. It's a good, it's a good hustle. <laughs> He's not for John. It's, it's a good hustle, that, that, that bar scene right there. I mean, I, I think he, I think he would have gotten it has it had it been for, she belonged to somebody else. You know? Mm-hmm. Because his, I mean, his whole his whole hustle was kind of honesty too. It's like he's being honest. I I want to touch your bare skin. I want to take you back to our uh, tour bus or whatever. Uh, we we have a big screen TV. Well, actually, we don't have a big screen TV, but we have a place for a big screen TV, and that'll eventually happen. And let, let's go. Let's let's get out of here. And this unique way of opening beer bottles would win any lady over, I'm sure. Nice. Yeah. And his his dentist would be a big fan too. Well, let's see right. in, in his eyeball, which I've seen before too at parties, and it's it's always fun to watch when somebody squints their eye and just <laughs> opens that beer bottle. You know. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I've always admired, even as a kid, I always admired the hustle of this movie because you got these this, these two guys, you know, Richard, Richard Pryor, and John Candy, Richard Pryor uh, inherits his money and. He's he's not he's like a like a small time dude. He's just a real humble dude. He's given this task to to either take a million or which they call the wimp clause, which I can see. Yeah. I, I probably would have done that too, or do what the plot suggests, you know. Here's thirty million, you're not allowed to have any assets, you're allowed to give so much to to gambling and charity and blah 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 and this is a hard thing to do, but he, he, he figures it out with 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 the quickness like the, he uses his own hustling skills to do it and the the, the stamp thing is brilliant to like oh what's the most expensive stamp you have and he gets away with that it. was the he, best part yeah that get, was the best part of the movie to me he gets away with <laughs> it and i would have done this a bunch of times it's a loophole because the post office destroys it you don't destroy it with the stamp and and um i i like i like that hustle and like like Lee said, even nowadays this is this this plays relevant, which you know we we, we let we let Trump in, uh, so somebody did, and this is based on you know something that that says oh we know this guy, so let's vote for this guy, and right the fact that he put himself out there against you know coming from Chicago land, uh, Cameron knows more than I do that the Guineas run the show still, and these <laughs> these, these these two Italians. You know, who are very corrupt. One of them are going to be mayor. So, when his his money spiked back up again, he gets the idea to to run for office. But it's kind of like a producer's thing. Yeah, he's very he's very charismatic. He's very this out of the other. But he doesn't expect to get elected. So he's saying, you know, don't don't vote for me. I, I I'm I'm laying the line. I don't know shit. So vote, either don't vote for me, don't, don't, don't vote for the other assholes either. Vote for none of the above. And I thought that yeah. was, was a brilliant move. Just say, it's like say the associates are saying, hey, just vote for Mickey Mouse instead. Write, write it on the ballot. And that's, uh, that, that, that was pretty brilliant. The whole plot of something he had no idea what to do, but he had to think on his toes. Um, when Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I love when they try to sue me. He's like, yeah, yeah, please sue me. Yeah, I'll, I'll give up a couple million right then and there. Well, I love he come. He keeps running into situations like he keeps getting like ideas for. Oh, well, I'll do this. I'll do that. And then every once in a while, he'll run into a little monkey wrench. Like, uh, if you win this election, which you are in danger of winning this election, despite your best efforts. You're gonna get a sixty thousand a dollar salary every year. And it's like shit. Well, I can't do that. So he throws the election and and, and runs and runs out of it. Um, like he's more concerned. Like honestly, his only concern seems to be to to play baseball. Like he's got this dream of I'm gonna you know get back to the pros and like I guess he had like a 
a few years or something like that in the pros and when was doing minor league. I think that's kind of the story, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah, he claimed to have a small shot with the Cubs. He was there. Yeah. And did the, you know, he's smart at the sign, old Monty Brewster, because as he says, he can get anybody out for three innings. So he's not a, he's a long reliever in, in, in baseball sense. Yeah. See, that stuff didn't play for me too well because I don't, watch baseball i don't like baseball i don't give two flying fucks about baseball so honestly all the i think my biggest complaint about this movie is all the baseball stuff in it like i i get that it's set up to make prior look like the common man common american blue collar guy with a dream and all that shit i get that but then we get like a segment where it's a baseball game and we get a training montage with baseball. And I could not give two flying fucks about that. <laughs> like <laughs> so, I, I, I feel like that's 10 minutes that should have been cut out of the movie, but uh, otherwise, I don't think so because the whole, the whole time this is happening, you know, the, yeah, I, I get your, your idea of, you know, liking baseball, blah, blah, blah. But this is like his only passion in the world is, is, is bringing his team to, well, he takes him back to Hackensack anyway to play the the big game that he sets up against the Yankees. The, mm. the three innings, yeah, basically with those th- th- the three innings, you guys could be gods, and they almost were too. They they almost beat him. It's and, a um, sad moment when when he gets taken off the mound when Jerry Arbach comes out and takes him off the mound. He's like, "Yep, yeah, you played good, but you got to go." You know, mm-hmm. it's like a sad moment. He's like, even with all this money, he's like, I still can't pay, play in the majors. You know, like, I, I, again, could give a shit about baseball. I used to like it when I was a kid, but as an adult, I don't, like you said, Lee, I just don't give two shits and a fart about, <laughs> about, about any kind of sports and not to ruffle anybody's feathers, but I'm just not a sports guy. But I get like that having your dreams dashed right in front of your eyes is like, you know, thirty million dollars at his disposal, and he still can't win the game. Yeah, but he, yeah. he does get it though. He come, he comes out at the end. I mean, I, I've known lots of guys who play organized sports, and that at some point in the, in the game, you know, not like when you're a little kid, but like when you're like a like a preteen to a teen, you're playing in the juniors. This this is any sport really. You're taken out that 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 crestfallen feeling, but you're a part of a team. So you feel that that sense of what Monty felt when he came, when he came out to do his his speech at the end, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, they got to feel like gods for three for three innings, and you know, for for minor league club that that was a pretty big deal to all of them. So that's uh, M- Monty's only moment of happiness in the film, while whilst he has that money to spend, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> which is something if, if you think about it, because he's he's pretty miserable throughout because he's he's so stressed out and. He wants to to get with uh, Miss Angela Drake, his his accountant, a lady, mm-hmm. and he can't tell her. Could you blame him? Yeah she, yeah, she thinks he's a fucking you know piece of shit for spending the money like he is. Like we're just throwing it all around, but he can't tell her or tell anybody why he's doing it. And it's it's it, I think Richard Pryor's stress as Monty Brewster is one of the one of the biggest uh, shining points for me. And um. The little bit that you do get a John Candy is is, is hilarious. Him, him walking in with that that suit on with the giant catcher's the gold catcher's <laughs> mask on. They made this for Johnny Bench, but he didn't come good, so they gave it to me. I, I love it so much. You know? <laughs> his his shit talk behind the the plate or whatever, or whenever you know, especially when they're playing the the Yankees or whatever. He's like, you know, I saw your wife out there the other day. He's like, yeah, yeah, she's an ugly bitch. <laughs> <laughs> and then the next batter comes up and he's like, yeah, did you see his wife? Yeah, she's an ugly bitch. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, I just feel like the last, like, 45 minutes of this movie, or at least last half of it, they just kind of just shuffled John Candy to a couple of walk-on bits. And it's just like, I, I wanted to see just, I don't know, I'm a big yeah. John Candy fan. I just wanted more of him, more interaction with Monty, with Pryor, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I got to talk about Stephen Collins, who's disgraced now for, if you guys know the story of that guy, but um, mm-hmm. before he used to act in a lot of things, and this is, uh, he plays Warren Cox, who's uh, set up as a foil by this, this trust company to make Monty fail, basically, and mm. uh, he's the boyfriend to, to Angela Drake, and she he gets jealous of Monty, because Monty's kind of making the moves on her, so... 
what does the guy that sabotaged the Enterprise do? He, he uh, this is motivation, more motivation to to sabotage Monty and by holding twenty thousand dollars for a few furniture deposit and say, hey, you know, you didn't get it. But of course, if, this is that kind of movie where M- Monty does get it at the end of this movie. So spoilers. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it almost it almost it almost feels like if this would work even better as like a sort of redemption arc kind of thing for Richard Pryor's character where, you know, he, he, he sort of fails, although, you know, he achieves his dream by sort of playing with the pros and stuff like that and helps his friends do it. He, you know, at the end, he's still got to be taken off the field or whatever and he's crestfallen, but he should, it should be one of those stories. I feel like where he gets happiness knowing that at the end he helped a bunch of people and that he doesn't get the 300 million. You know, he he actually gets to the, the little message of, hey, you know, you can actually have a happy life without having a bunch of money. Um, at the, and also, I like that, you know, he seems at his happiest in the movie for the, for the throughout the running time when he's just giving other people money. He's just giving people tons of money for whatever frivolous little thing they do for him. It's like, oh, Yakov Smirnoff, you want to be my personal driver? I'll pay you like $5,000 a week or whatever the fuck it is, you know, like... Yeah. Yeah. When he like hires the security guards at the bank, the first thing he does is like, all right, I'll, would they pay you here three fifty? Oh, I'll pay you like four thousand dollars a week. No, I'll pay you five thousand mm-hmm. dollars a week. You bring all your buddies for three grand a week. Smartest thing he did. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah. If you know, if you don't get that Star Trek joke, I'm sorry, but um, it's there. You know. <laughs> um. Pat Hingle, uh, I think it plays a great role in this movie because he's on Monty's side. While those other guys are going against them, and he constantly shows up as like a like a motivation for Monty. I think that's yeah. that's important. And um, yeah, and it's and it's and it's nice. Like in some movies like this, right? They'll 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 have like some not not necessarily intentional, but just kind of like uh, racism in there of the time kind of thing, or you know the old rich white guy is a bit of a prick. It's like not, not in that case, in that relationship between uh, Pat Hingle and Richard Pryor. It's like, he actually likes Richard Pryor. Like he considers him an equal and in, in, in some ways at the very least, or likes his character, you know, kind of thing. So yeah, I think he's safe to say he admires him a lot. Mm-hmm. So it's like, it's, it's a very different thing that you generally don't see in movies that are kind of like this. Like generally the rich guys are always, assholes who have to learn to like the schlubby blue collar guy, you know, and then in this case, it's, it's not that, which is refreshing to see. Um, our regular, one of our regulars, Peter Jason shows up in this movie as Chuck Fleming, who's, um, the reporter that you see throughout the film. I, I think that, you know, this is probably in, um, one of my favorite roles he's ever played because he's really showcased in this movie because he's, he's he's keeping you keep you down with the play by play of what's going on with Monty throughout. Like you're, you're watching on the screen, but if you were watching, you know, news at home, you know, with Chuck Fleming, action news with Chuck Fleming, you mm-hmm. you would it's just enough to, to 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 keep you in it. And I I, I think that he's showcased incredibly well in this movie and. Um, I see that he's on the the, screen, the the Shout Factory Blu-ray extras, and I'm digging in my brain because uh, I bought this and I remember watching it. I lost it in the fire, unfortunately. But you, you think that he'd narrate the extras as as Chuck Fleming? It'd be amazing, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but he doesn't. Seems like a given, doesn't it? It seems like a given. I, I kept thinking. I kept looking at his face and thinking that he needed a mustache and like it could have been a proto Ron Burgundy almost, you know, <laughs> there you go. Go fuck yourself, San Diego. Yeah. <laughs> go uh, fuck yourself, Chicago. I like you guys and I'm Chuck Fleming. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you guys mentioned people show up in this movie. You know, I, um, I, I noticed today that Lynn Shea was in this movie. I, I had to look it up. Is that Lynn Shea? And I really? Low down, yeah, she plays one of the reporters at the at the rally. You can see her. She's taught. She has speaking lines. And if, if you look, you know, even real close, she's very young in this movie. It's just. Yeah. I was, it was nice to see Lynn Shea in, in, in a young role. And I, I love I love Critters, too. And Easter is coming upon us. So 
I'll get my Lin mm-hmm. Shay fix uh, the uh, in, in, my, in my own way. Um, <laughs> well, so Orini Santoni, who's uh, Cobra's partner, he he shows up in what I call the Superior Bad Boys film. Uh, mm-hmm. play, plays Vince Vince R- 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 Rapolito. I think that was one of the one of the candidates, but the, he. I've always liked that actor because of Cobra and Bad Boys, but he's been in a bunch of other things. Ooh. Yeah. There, there's some I actually picked up on one that uh, being uh, still, admittedly, I am still a Walking Dead fan, but I saw that uh, the, the, the actress's name escapes me, but the one who plays the interior decorator, Warren Cox's ex, that uh, she she was the, the governor of the... Um, of Alexandria for like a season and a half. I was like, kept looking. I'm like, God, I know this woman. Wow. And I looked it up. I'm like, sure enough, season and a half, The Walking Dead. I'm like, much younger, <laughs> much, yeah, much, yeah. much younger. I was like, eh, that's why I don't recognize her. It's, it's like yeah. were, we were. I was on Lee's show last night, and it's like, yeah, that's that lady that Matthew Broderick was plowing while she was say, screaming, "Fill me up in an election." <laughs> that, that's that lady. You know, it's it's really strange how stuff comes <laughs> up like that, but. <laughs> yes, known murderer Matthew Broderick. Known murder, known murderer Matthew Broderick. Yes, even get a little Alan Graft action. You know, is the what the the guy that comes in to help start the fucking fist fight in the bar. There's like oh, yeah. you, you blink, you you you'll miss just about everybody in this. Just like Lynn Shay, you blink and like, oh, but there she was and there she went. Mm, yeah. If I was if I was watching that close to it, yeah, I wouldn't I would have never noticed the young the young Lin Che. But you could go back and watch this one now because it, it it is enjoyable, guys. It's a nice mm-hmm. it's a nice human story and and it has has a great you know plot to it, a great thing where this this low down guy who has no idea about what businesses you know succeeds. I I I, I love the underdog. And Monty mm. Monty represents the underdog, the guy who only made eleven, whose whose highest payday paycheck was eleven thousand dollars for a whole year, and for playing for the Toledo Mudhens. <laughs> um, it's just it's just good. I I really enjoy it, and we'll get to some 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 factoids about this movie in just a minute here, as soon as I bring them up. And, um. I should, I should have done that before, right, dumbass? Uh, so I gotta, I gotta ask: is 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 there an actual baseball field with a train track on it? Legit? Like, is that a thing? That let's see. You know, I read somewhere in the Wikipedia that that was a thing somewhere, but I don't remember the details it's, of it. It's, yeah. it's a Texas League thing. It says right here: for a few seasons, the train passes through the outfield of the stadium. Where the Bulls play in the 1930s and 40s, that was a common occurrence at ballparks used by teams in the Texas leagues. And um, really, I'm not sure if they had spring training in Texas, but now it's more Florida and Arizona. So I think they'll have the, the training Man, problems Texas there. Is, yeah. Tex- Texas has always been fucked up, hasn't it? Them, them, them <laughs> yep. Texas problems. They got they got they got guns. They got trains in their outfield. God damn it. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, it's, that's freedom. <laughs> freedom is trying to catch, you know, a fly ball and then getting ran over by a locomotive. Yeah. I, I thought this was neat. Um, Neil Hamilton, who plays Commissioner Gordon in Batman 66 and on the TV sh- series, uh, played the executor of the will in, in Versus Millions. So you had two, oh, yeah. you had two Commissioner Gordons in this movie. So. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Huh. Oh my gosh! That's I pretty... thought he was familiar. I didn't recognize who the fuck that was. I was like, "Oh, okay, yeah, I get it." And you've right. seen him like every episode, so but you're just looking for Batgirl mm-hmm. to come out in that that tight uh, purple outfit. That, you know, that's <laughs> the thing. Yeah, Yvonne Craig. Um, you know, yeah, when you have that, that purple outfit is out there, you don't really notice Commissioner well, Gordon at all. Mm-mm. Well, like, just... wait, Commissioner Gordon was in that scene? Oh, man, there's nothing like coming home from school and turning that on and. You seen the bad cycle shoot by. You knew it was going to be a good day because it was a bad mm-hmm. girl episode. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, this film has many connections with Walter Hill's earlier film, 48 Hours. Um, of course, Torchy shows up. Um, 
the guy who's the, the bookie in this movie who who allows him to bid on all the long shots and then loses his fucking shirt is wearing Reggie Hammond's suit in, from, from 48 Hours. Ah, uh, uh, okay. That's pretty neat. Where are we at here? Ooh, do, 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 do. This could almost be the Walter Hill multiverse, and he's just a different version of, of uh, Reggie. Yeah, it, 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 it exists, man. The Walter Hill multiverse. Uh, this is the, the world building we're trying to build here with with the torches, and he, he's doing it all for mm-hmm. us, apparently. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Well, I picked up on one was uh, Margot Rose that was the torches waitress was... Uh old Billy Bear's girlfriend in 48 hours. I, I thought that was her, and I did not look that up, but I'm glad you did, man, because that, that's, uh, that's interesting, you know. So was was she the same character? Because I remember in the in the 48 hours, she said that she had worked as, as a waitress there, so. Uh, we'll go back. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We'll go back mm-hmm. find Multiverse right theory, hard at work. Yes. <laughs> Multiverse theory, hard at work, man. That'd be very interesting if that was true. I'm going to look right now. Um, shoot. Fix this in post, I guess. Huh? Why don't you do that for? Guys, if you ever use IMDb, they, 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 they give you an option to edit uh, certain things, and that's just retarded. <laughs> it's just mm-hmm. so stupid. You know? I can say I'm in this movie, but I'm not. That, 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 <laughs> that, that doesn't make any sense, right, guys? <laughs> no. Although, don't you need to have, like, an IMDb Pro account or something like that to, like, actually get your name, like, listed? Yes. So no. Clear. No? No. Nope. I, I, I put all my own uh, IMDb stuff up on my own, and I've never had a Pro account. I think, you you know, you got to have, like, to have some of the information and pictures and video and stuff like that. you got to have a Pro account. Okay. Because I've so, had people go up and, like, edit the stuff on my IMDb, and they're like, come on, man, like took me fucking three submissions to do that. Yeah, and I mean, who is going to deny Cameron Scott's award-winning turn in Saving Private Ryan? Like he Right, they, right. They can't they can't take your Oscar away from you, Cameron. <laughs> Apparently they can take Oscars away now. Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> Unfortunately, we'll never I know. Want, I don't want a fucking Oscar anyway. <laughs> it, it just says Torchy's waitress and we'll never know unless we ask the man himself, you know, one day hopefully, you know. Pipe dream. Oh, I'm sure he'd, he'd just, I'm sure he'd just love to field those nerd questions. So, uh, uh, Mr. Hill, were you setting up a multiverse back in the 80s? <laughs> I was like, he'd probably of... be just like, nah, I'm just trying to give my people extra work, man. <laughs> yeah. We're just, we're just putting it together, man, movie by movie. And, you know, we're losing sleep over this, Walter. Yeah. And it's, it's, um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And then he would also he'd also add in just as an aside. And by the way, Southern Comfort was not about Vietnam. Uh, well, right. Okay. <laughs> we, okay, we, we, we okay. begged to differ there, Walter. Sure, Come on now. Sure it <laughs> yeah. What's on the screen says otherwise. <laughs> uh, Peter Bogdanovich had originally wanted to direct this film with John Ritter, so I, I'm I'm sad and and glad that didn't happen at the same time. So just... yeah, that could have worked. I could I could see that working, but I I, I think it works better with Pryor. I, he, Pryor he, does better with the whole manic thing he, he it's just him losing his mind for mm-hmm. an hour straight in the movie just trying to no as he's trying to like spend money people are making money for him like john candy being the best friend in the world is like hey man i invested and made you 10 million dollars and he just loses his shit <laughs> it's like no i'm back where i fucking started like no f-bombs in this one it was pg but you know so mm-hmm. but uh yeah i was just like I got to make a comment on this, like John Candy's character. I know I keep bringing everything back to John Candy. Talk about being the best friend in the world. Like, he's just like there. He's like, man, I stowed away the money you gave me. We'll buy a cabin. We'll fly out there. We'll Mm -hmm. go fishing. You know, we'll fly women and booze out there. And he's just like, you could tell, like, Richard Pryor at that point really, really wants to tell him. And he almost does. He almost slips up. But talk about being the best friend in the world. He's like, listen, we're just two beer drinking fucking fist throwing uh, baseball playing buddies and you know i'm here with you whether you got the money or not he was there with them to the bitter end and i love that aspect of it I yeah they really, really do the, the guy he hires his personal photographer is, is a great foil to john kennedy in this movie um it's it's 
Uh, yeah, they well, don't. He tells him, eat, "Don't why are you fucking eating with your hands, man? You don't you know they made forks." And he's like, "Yeah, why don't you put back that bottle of champagne and get back the ashtray while you're at it?" You know? Yeah, <laughs> he's he's constantly looking out for me. Like I said, like that's that's great best friend material, and I, I think I think it's enough. I, I think it's I think it's really great, and th- this film is a lot of fun. Uh, the the end song I I, I think doesn't talked about enough and. It's a Patti LaBelle song, uh, r- written by mm-hmm. Huey Lewis and Ry Cooter. I thought that was pretty dope, too. And I always loved Patti LaBelle's voice. I blame my mother for that, because she, she would play those records in the house and just uh, embroiled in my brain that uh, she she would be a diva that I would love. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah. You know, yeah. Speaking, oh, speaking of music, I got a question. Do you, did you guys feel like this is the strangest Ry Cooter soundtrack? Like, it's not atypical of his normal sound for the most part. Yeah, it's, it's it, it seemed very, very big budgety. Just, very very mm-hmm. synth heavy, and, you know, I, I, I... Yeah, it wasn't like that same kind of Ry Cooter twang, but at the same time... I don't dislike it. it. I no, just thought it was unusual. To, to make it... It's, it's a real different... Oh, I'm sorry. I was just gonna say. I was just gonna say. It's. It's. I mean, when you kind of think of it, this is yet again Walter Hill doing like a really kind of different film from what you kind of expect. You know, given his first initial cu- couple films, um, he's he's basically just doing a like a you know a big comedy with big names in it, and it's kind of a light. It's still like light and breezy, and like it, it's it's not got the edge that most of his stuff previous to this has had. And so I think the music kind of reflects that too. Like the music's much more just Ry Cooter doing typical like eighties comedy soundtrack, which is, yeah, it's weird. <laughs> well, he adapted to it too. And I really want it's cause it's really like really grandiose and really, you know, upbeat, you know, for the most part when the times it needs to be. And, mm-hmm. and I think he does it real well considering what we're used to, which is that, you know, that desperate, you know, t- t- when I say desperate, I don't mean he's desperate. I mean, the music sounds like desperate and it's got mm-hmm. that, that twang to it. And, uh, he'll, he'll get back to that with, with the next movie, of course. Um, we'll talk about that later. Um, but I, I think without prior in this role where this is prime Richard Pryor and you know, he's doing these movies and, I love most of the stuff that he's done as far as movies go because they're all <clears throat> very different roles. You know, some kind of hero, uh, busting loose is kind of like the same role he plays in our Patreon choice, the toy. But it's it's a lot more. He he's trying to help those kids in a way. Yeah, it's it's almost the same movie if you think about it. it just, but he mm. has a, he has a group of kids, and I, I don't want to get into uh, busting loose, but those kids got some problems, yo. <laughs> I remember. Pretty vividly. <laughs> um, what else? I'm trying, trying to figure out where he's the race car driver. Uh, but yeah, blue blue collar is a thing that he made, which is again mm-hmm. so something you wouldn't expect him to be in. This this mm-hmm. drama about union people, and yeah, plays it so well. I mean, he managed to, to play put, put himself into this role of his his whole self because yeah, I love the balance between. Nice guy, Monty Brewster, and manic Monty Brewster when things aren't going his way. But he still yeah. he still manages it to, to still manages to hold it together. And I I I could really appreciate um the way they went with this and without prior, but not imagining it with John Ritter. I I, I think he would be the 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 white equivalent to to Richard Pryor in this role. So I, I would like to. I would like to, in a way, I would like to see that, you know? Mm. Um, I'll kick it to Cameron. Anything else to say about Bruce's millions? And, uh, yeah, tell us about it, man. You know, like I said, uh, even though I, I did at the beginning of the show said it is a bit of a misfire, just because I feel like it underuses or misuses John Candy, that means that I... I I love this movie. I I love the friendship between Pryor and Candy. I would love to see them do more of a, <laughs> something more like a 48 hours, if you can mm-hmm. imagine that. You know, like a buddy cop kind of movie where they actually get to interact with each other on a visceral level. Uh, 
it's really good. Uh, I love the, all the little cameos to it. And as an adult, I, I have a greater appreciation for this that I never had as a, as, a, as a teen or as a child. I just never got it when I was younger. It just didn't make sense to me. I'm like, rich people spending 30 million because they can? Like, why? But, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> I, I, I get it now. <laughs> uh, it, I think it's says something that this is really, you know, Will's one straight up comedy. And, you know, it's still a hit, a bit of a, a bit of a misfire, you know, it hits a little bit to left to center, but uh, I love it. I, I, I love it for, it hits all those nostalgia buttons, you know, and the member berries are all there. And, you, you know, Richard Pryor really brings uh, a humanity to it that I don't think anybody else could have brought. Like uh, you were saying earlier, uh, uh, Gary, you know, about like uh, John Ritter was almost cast. That would have been great, but and I love me some John Ritter, but I think if you would have changed this and not had Richard Pryor in it, I don't know that John Ritter could have carried that kind of manic quality that, that Pryor had. Yeah, he might have. It would have been nice to see it in an alternative universe, what he would have done with it. But can you imagine that? John Ritter and John Candy together? That would have been something else. But, uh, yeah, mm. it, it, it's it's great. Uh, I was really, really happy revisiting this one. Don't talk about sports ball stuff so much. You're going to bore Lee here. What's, 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 wrong, what's wrong with you, man? What's up? <laughs> Lee, uh, anything else you'd like to say about the film, sir? Um, no, I, I think my thoughts kind of echo what uh, Cameron is saying for the most part here. Although I, I, I will say I don't love it as much as Cameron uh, obviously does, but uh, I did like it. Uh, I thought it was a, a decent watch. It kept me chuckling all the way through. Like I said, no big laugh out loud moments for me or anything, but I thought the chemistry between the characters was good. I thought the story was fun. I thought the, the whole concept was kind of light and breezy and it was kind of an easy watch again, maybe a little too long because of the baseball shit. But uh, other than that, I enjoyed it. I thought it was, you know, really well done. Yeah. And I'll echo what Lee said. It could have shaved 10, 20 minutes off this movie. Probably would have been better. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, unlike, you know, Mr. Bill Cosby and something came before him. I, I don't think his, his career is all that tarnished and there's, there's plenty to watch. And his filmography that I forgot to mention. I mean, his, his stuff in the black exploitation genre is worth your time. The Mac and uh, I think mm-hmm. Hit, I think Hit has Bernie Casey in it. I'm gonna let him hit the button right there. Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, Billy D. Williams, um, Richard Pryor, we mentioned. Yeah, it's Billy D. Williams who he's also in Lady Sings the Blues with. Um, the the stuff I used to watch a lot, you know. Moving, uh, I've seen on cable. I don't know, how, probably more than this. I've seen moving on cable. Mm-hmm. Uh, Harlem Nights d- deserves your love because everybody's in it. You, sh- you should check it out. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to think of the movie where he plays the race car driver. It's going to drive me crazy now. But um, which way is up? Of course, Car Wash. Was it uh, Grease Lightning? Was yeah, that the yeah, name? Grease of it? Lightning. Yeah. Where's the race car driver? Mm-hmm. Mm. And, uh, this is it's one of the few movies where he doesn't have a mustache, and Richard just looks weird without a mustache. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> telling you. And, and a film that I love, but Lee would hate, because right? it's about it's about a minor league baseball team in the in the Negro leagues. Uh, I, I discovered this film the the for myself, the Bingo Long Traveling All Stars and Motor Kings. It's a long time to a film, but this is a film about a baseball team that includes uh, Billy D. Williams, James Earl Jones, Richard Pryor, and. Um, so many other good ones. Stan Shaw shows up in that movie, and that's a character actor that I love. Let so. me just clarify for the audience what Gary said here. I would hate that movie because it's about baseball, not because it's about Negro baseball players, okay? We, they don't know you by now. And I'll, I'll, I'll say, should I put a uh, uh, thing before every podcast? Because I'm sure in our Patreon review, we're going to say some questionable things. Because we're doing we're, <laughs> spoilers, we're doing the toy with Richard Pryor oh. as well, which is problematic as fuck. But I would watch it ten more times, okay? <laughs> but there, <laughs> there's some racial overtones in that movie, and some? so 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 <laughs> should we apologize ahead of time now? Uh, um, I'm not apologizing for anything. Or, or I, yeah, if I, I don't, I don't apologize. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> just, just shut the fuck up and go watch uh, California Sweet. Just enjoy yourself, okay? Because <laughs> everybody's in that movie too. So check that out. Uh, 
I have I'm not a whole lot to say about this movie. I, I I've always enjoyed Richard Pryor's shtick, and like I said, I I saw some of these way earlier, and I discovered other things later, like the the, the brilliant work with him and Gene Wilder, which should not go unnamed, and. It's, it's 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 just one of those actors that's always been around. I, I never knew. I I still to this day only heard part of one of his comedy records, but he he came from that world. Oh, yeah. He adapted to this world. I think so fine. I mean, just being going through the problems he had with the drugs and stuff. I think he he uh he adapted real real good. And this is a great human interest story. And he plays the role to a T, and I can't see nobody else in the role. I, I just can't do it, and that's just the kind of guy I am. But Bruce's Millions, if you have your doubts, and if you're like Cameron, who saw it once very, very young, and it's, it's worth going back to, I, I think. And we, yeah. We, we think so, too, so so check it out. <laughs> um, Pushing, p- pimping, all that good stuff. Cameron, where can they find you, man? Oh, they can find me at Cinema Degeneration. We're on everything, uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, my sh- show was over on Podbean. I got about – lost track now. I got about eight or nine different sh- themed shows. Uh, I'm getting ready to pump out another one here in about another month. Uh, i got to keep that secret because my partner doesn't want me – releasing any information that about that but we got a couple of new episodes out here coming out here real soon a new sequel to deja vu episode i got a without warning episode with my buddy uh cory dawson that i'm really proud of but it's a five hour episode oh wow uh, Ooh. Holy shit. so might be releasing that in like two or three chapters but it was uh we did that one way into the wee hours in the morning until like 3 a.m one day but I'm really proud of it, and uh, actually getting ready to uh, work on my last film. Um, I'm probably going to be retiring from the business here. I know it's kind of a weird way to, to make a segue into that, but yeah, I'm going to just be concentrating on writing from here on out. I'm no longer going to be acting and working on productions and whatnot, but uh, I get to pl- I get to play a, a getaway driver in a film. Yeah. So nice. it's knocking off a bucket list. So I, I, way I'm con- considered, I'm going out on top. So fuck it. Are you gonna Are you gonna wear a suit like Ryan O'Neill? These are important questions. You know. Mm-hmm. No, I, I, but I ain't gonna be dressed in all black. You gotta so keep. I'll you gotta keep that classy. You know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. One thing I forgot to mention is that um, <laughs> we get very rare get Walter Hill news, and we have some Walter Hill news. Vestron is putting out Extreme Prejudice on Blu-ray uh, very soon, which is the film we'll be doing two films from now. On May uh-huh. May 17th, it'll be available. Um, a special edition Blu-ray with a digital copy. The Vestron titles now, this will be like 13 bucks on pre-order right now. So it's just not very expensive. But it will include audio commentary with film historians C. Courtney Joyner and Henry Parker. Isolated score selections with audio interviews from from his music historian John uh, Takis. Interviews: interview with director Walter Hill, The Major's Agenda, an interview with Michael actor Michael Ironside, The War Within, an interview with actor Clancy Brown, Capturing the Chaos, an interview with the, the DOP Henry F. Le, Matthew F. Leonetti, uh, some promotional materials, teaser trailer, theatrical trailer, TV spots. Vintage EP, e, EPK. What, what is the EPK, Cameron, for people who don't know? Uh, maybe you know. Oh, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, wish I did. S- still gallery. I am, I am not tech savvy. That's okay. <laughs> um, in case you didn't know, this film stars Nick Nolte, Powers Booth, and those guys mentioned, plus some other guys, William Forsyth, uh, Larry B. Scott, not playing a nerd or a, gay, or a gay person, which nothing wrong with either one of those things, but, you know, it's a very straight-laced role for him. So if you want to watch, you know, Nick Nolte and Powers Booth be very sweaty before we do it for the show, go go pick up uh, this movie. I don't think you'll be disappointed. I think it's spectacular. So, Oh, I'd love to some Extreme Prejudice. I'll be the first in line to buy me a copy of that. Oh, uh, EPK, that's Electronic Press Kits. Okay. So that that'd be like all your your press kit materials, but given to you in like a digital form, I guess this is what they're saying here. Yeah, cool. A lot, a lot, a lot of uh, a lot of hairy people. I think 
Clancy Brown still has his, his beard from, from Buckaroo Banzai in this movie, so... Oh. <laughs> okay, gotta love that, man. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Lee, um, tell us where you can find your stuff, my friend. All right. Uh, my podcast is called They Must Be Destroyed on site. Uh, it's at tmbdos.podbean.com, and... Latest episode, I've, I've decided, like, you know, my, my co-host, uh, the lovely Lady Lee, has not had a lot of picks lately. So I was like, you know what? You got free reign. You can do some picks for the next few episodes or whatever. And then she goes and picks Ringmaster from 1998, the Jerry Springer movie. Mm. And uh, as of this recording uh, the night before, we did that with Gary as a guest on the show. And, well, that was something. <laughs> That that should be out uh, for a while by the time you hear this episode. So uh, go look for that and whatever else I'm doing on the, on that feed and at that website tmbdos.podbean.com. Um, yeah, this show and any other show I do for Legion could be found on the Butcher Shop uh, feed and your your Apple iTunes and your different podcatchers. Go go look for it there. Rate and review. You guys know the score. It, it helps us in, in the long run. If you guys go rate and review us on on your different podcatchers, helps us be seen mm-hmm. and whatnot. That'd be much much appreciated. And I, I enjoy hate mail, so if you want to send it to me, uh, that's sinbeefpodcast at gmail dot com. Just, just just send it away if you hate what we're doing here. And if you're lucky, we'll so, you'll read it on the air. Go ahead, Lee. I'm sorry. Yeah. Don't don't be don't be lazy bums. You, you you people, you listen to us. We we provide entertainment, and really the big thing and the thing we don't usually talk about, but we'll peel back the layers here a little bit. Our our major domo at Legion Podcasts, Bo Ransdale, he likes the validation. He likes the kind words. It it makes him feel good. And don't you want to make him feel good? He's a nice man. You want to make him feel good. So you know, rate our podcasts and thumb them up and whatever else you have to do. Send us money, whatever. Stick, stick the thumb in only halfway though. Just, just the tip. Okay. It's just, a, yeah. uh... just a one knuckler. <laughs> <laughs> I always thought the phrase, give me two fingers of whiskey. was kind of nasty. That sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Keep your fucking hands out of my whiskey, please. <laughs> I don't know. Hey, it gives you the, the implication that somebody sticking their fingers in your glass and they pour it, and the fact that you know two fingers. Uh, ne- never mind. I'm not going to go there. We'll, we'll get we'll get <laughs> we'll get offensive enough with our next review for the Patreon, which would be the toy uh, from 1982 with Richard Pryor and Jackie Gleason, and uh, one of the few legit acting roles for Scotty Schwartz, unless you like that sort of thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're saying he did he did some non legit acting. You oh yeah, like huh? oh. we'll talk about the we'll talk about his thing. Uh, oh yeah, there. we're gonna talk about it. There's <laughs> lack there's lack thereof. <laughs> but the next film you'll hear us talk about in this show, um, which I don't know the Patreon choice to be, and I don't I don't know it's right now. And we're gonna record the one next day. So by take behind the curtain, we record these in the same sitting. The Patreon, the regular one, but um. We're gonna take a uh, a road trip with Lightning Boy and his uh, and his token black friend who sold his soul, a la Robert Johnson style. And we're gonna do Crossroads, and I'm looking forward to doing it. And um, going hoboing with with Jamie Gertz, which could mean many things. And man, <laughs> what a what a prime piece she was. She she still she still is. She's not doing much now because I think her her. Her husband owns the Atlanta Hawks, so she, she's she's oh, pretty yeah. she's pretty well off. She doesn't need to act anymore. <laughs> um, yeah, this one uh, has been great, and um, this has been Last Call of Torchies, and we'll see you all next time. Later, folks. Bye bye. <laughs>